I am joined now live by Immigration Minister Mark Miller. Minister, good to see you. Thanks for making the time. You didn't do anything. You know, I have, like, I have to challenge you on that. Like, you, you, you didn't do anything for at least a year after that. It's like you kind of turned a blind eye. Is there a reason for that? Well, yeah. Why did your government wait until just this January to start addressing one stream of it and now to address the rest of it? And could you not have addressed things earlier in order to mitigate some of the issues your Canadians are now dealing with? We have an immigration. What does that mean? What does significance mean? You'll see mean? when we announce the levels. Did you not owe it a year ago or a year and a half ago when those, when those, you know, when those levels were hitting 450,000, 500,000? Which have jumped in the past year. I think one of the reasons we focused... Past two years. One of the start off and ask you what the objective of these changes are, particularly with the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. Is it, for example, to address uh, remarkably low youth employment rates? Is it more broad than that? Like, when this is fully realized, what is the goal? Well, it is broader than that. We've seen recent youth unemployment rates jump. Uh, earlier on this year, I announced the reduction of temporary workers in this country from 7% to 5%. What that looks like is a lot different than just temporary foreign workers. Temporary foreign workers are a very small part of that pie chart. International students, the postgraduate work permits that come with us, come with them, the humanitarian efforts that we've deployed to welcome Ukrainians here, they all form part of that category. So you, you can't just send people back to Ukraine and say this is all solved. We have to actually do this in a surgical way that makes sense for Canadians, but also makes sense for the economy. Uh, in the temporary foreign worker space, people working in, in the agricultural sector, transformation in, uh, in Tim Hortons, we've seen an overheating that uh, needs to be adjusted ever since uh, the end of COVID. And that's something I think every Canadian expects us to do. Uh, those numbers do affect affordability and not all those people can become permanent residents. So th the announcements that we made today, that Minister Boissonneau made today, are sort of a smart reflection of what we need to do to ramp that down back to what looks like pandemic, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, it isn't the end of the story. Getting from 7% of the population to 5% is a much more significant step than that. I still have adjustments to make in the international student program. I made some significant ones in January. But it's part of a total package that we are continuing to deploy. The measures, of, most measures of which will be out by, by the fall. The Bank of Canada said that the measures that we've taken to date are not sufficient to getting to those goals, but there are initial ones that I will announce. I took one two weeks ago to prevent people with labor market impact assessments that come here on visas from getting, uh, from getting jobs. If people are here to visit, they shouldn't be working. So that's sort of some of the measures that we'll be announcing. We have announced and we'll be announcing again in the fall. Why the f are you lying? Why? Why are you always lying? You demarketed the end of COVID, right? As, as, as a sort of a, a point at which things started to accelerate. What, is it fair of Canadians to ask now if you're undoing a lot of that? why the undoing didn't start earlier. Because for example, if you look at you know temporary residents who hold uh, work permits, that number has increased by 150% over two years. It was 60%, not, not just low wage, I'm speaking more broadly. It was up 60% last July, year over year. Why did your government wait until just this January to start addressing one stream of it and now to address the rest of it? And could you not have addressed things earlier in order to mitigate some of the issues your Canadians are now dealing with? Well, I'd say 2020, Hindsight is uh, is always something we can in indulge in. I, I, as a thoughtful government, you always have to reflect of what you could have done faster, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. I I'd simply say this: uh, the labor shortages that we saw even a year ago are no longer there. Uh, markets are contracting, labor markets are contracting, uh, and there's no longer the needs for the people that we were bringing in those amounts to to be here or to come or to come to Canada. That's just reality, and I think everyone expects governments to adjust. Um, but did the need exist a year ago? You, you, are you asserting that it did? It's very possible in some areas it did. Uh, I think now it's quite obvious that we do have to adjust. Uh, as a minister, I have a responsibility to look forward and figure out what we need to do next to make sure that we have a number of temporary workers here that make sense for addressing affordability, for addressing the needs. But there's also the risk of over-adjusting and damaging the economy. The International Monetary Fund has said quite clearly that immigration has been a huge fuel in making sure that we didn't plunge into a recession like other countries in our situation. Uh, and there has been some benefits that the Bank of Canada has clearly highlighted with some challenges that have come with it in and around housing, in and around affordability. And Canadians, as we've heard quite clearly over the course of the last year, have asked us to make some adjustments and that's what we're doing. And we're doing, I think so, in a, in a thoughtful fashion. And I do, I, I do respect the fact that you're talking about 
you know, you don't want to overshoot essentially that not everything is static. It hasn't been necessarily what it was a year ago. But the Canadian press, I remember a number of months ago, reported that your predecessor received a briefing two years ago in which it was clearly outlined that both the temporary and permanent stream would have a salient impact on affordability. You didn't do anything. You know, I have like I have to challenge you on that. Like you, you, you didn't do anything for at least a year after that. It's like you kind of turned a blind eye. Is there a reason for that? Well, look, I, I read those memos assiduously pretty much every day. We expect the public service to give us pros, cons of, uh, of what impacts any measure that we take could generate. Those are risks that we take, uh, and I think Canadians uh, should see them and, and judge us for them. Uh, but there are also risks in not taking those decisions and not taking those uh, plunging into a recession, a real concern that would affect all Canadians. Uh, currently now with rising interest rates, it's obvious that we do have to make a number of adjustments that economists are looking at and expecting us to, to, to make in terms of changes. Um, but hand, sort of picking and choosing little in, things out of memos that you hear from the public service, I don't think is a necessarily helpful exercise. We expect the best advice from public servants. That's advice that was given in a memo, but they've also given us advice of the risks in not taking those measures as well. And so your assessment at the time was don't take any measures and let affordability become an issue? Well, not at all. I mean, I think we've acted quite aggressively on, on affordability. I mean, if we didn't have... Canadians don't feel that at all. Well, look, we certainly hear at the doors from Canadians what they're feeling. Uh, obviously, Canadians look to governments to be responsible for decisions that have been taken. There's also a risk in not taking those decisions. Uh, if we had a labour market that was contracted in a recession, I think if you're looking at revisionist history, we could have gone through one, even two recessions, and I don't think Canadians would have wanted that either. On the broader picture of immigration levels today, I thought it was very interesting that the prime minister did not close the door to changes to the permanent stream, right? And, and that is something that under your government has been a, a very specific policy measure. We're now at about half a million going to be in. And, and, and the last time we interviewed, uh, spoke to you about this issue, you said it would stay, you know, the la latest plan showed that level staying there for the next two years. Can you expand on what kind of things your government is considering? Are you c considering very bluntly a reduction in permanent immigration? Well, we are... Bash, we're looking at a number of options. When I paused the levels last year, it was with an undertaking to talk to Canadians and see what those levels look like or should be. There has been significant growth, I think for good reason in the last few years. Uh, that economic growth, again, has been indispensable in making sure that the gross domestic product of the country has grown, that the entrance into the workforce, all driven by immigration, was assured. Uh, but now it's time to take a look at them and put real options on the table for the prime minister and for other cabinet ministers to look at and not cosmetic changes uh, simply to deal with public opinion. Real significant change to make sure that we have an immigration. What does level that mean? That is, what does well, significant change? You'll see change when we announce the levels. It's not something I would announce publicly, particularly without having had that discussed in cabinet. Uh, it has not had the full robust cabinet discussion that uh, is due to it. And I expect to hear from my cabinet colleagues who are sometimes of different positions and views as to what the immigration levels of the country look like. Uh, so when I say all options are on the table, uh, there, are, there, are, there will be considerations about whether we reduce, uh, what type of immigration that we are supporting. 60% of our immigration is economically driven. That is uh, probably unprecedented with countries that we compare ourselves to. Uh, but we have to see if we've done this in the right way. And if that growth merits to continue, needs to be paused or, uh, or even reduced. That wasn't the question. <laughs> Why is that the conversation happening right now? And I ask with respect specifically to permanent, because every interview I've conducted with you or the housing minister over the last year, you have been very insistent that what was driving the ills associated with immigration was on the temporary side of things. And I even remember in January asking you this question about permanent, the permanent stream. And you said like questions in that, you know, you were, you were kind of hearing a lot of questions in that area and some of them had undertones of racism. Like that is the way that your government pushed back against questions about permanent residency. And now at one of the most politically vulnerable times for your party, you're willing to look at cutting those numbers. Is that why? Well, no, look, I'm not going to presume that racism doesn't exist, but there are legitimate views within Canadian society of people I would never think of calling Could your racist. government have been more entertaining to that those views previously? Well, I think we should always be open to these points of views. The conversations that I have, for example, around the Easter table, Christmas table, uh, they're different views. Some people have a different view on immigration than I do. Uh, this is a country that has largely benefited and built a, a, an amazing consensus around immigration. Um, but again, you're, we're hearing from different parts, different parts of Canada, different 
different, even people in my own family that have different views on immigration. I think we owe it as a responsible government to listen to them, even if we don't. Did you not owe it a year ago or a year and a half well, ago when thinking, those when those you know when those levels were hitting 450,000, 500,000? Well, they've, they haven't hit 500,000. Yeah, right. This year we will be at 485. Uh, it, there has been some aggressive growth, I think with good reason. And those people are productive members of the economy, productive members of society. Uh, but I think as a responsible country in the current context that we're facing, we have to look at those levels and say, do we continue along those lines? Or do we look at it and say, where can we best rationalize things? Where can we have a sustainable level within the levels that we see with the other countries of the OECD? Um, and have a conversation that, that's devoid of racism, uh, but also reflective of what different people are thinking. Those people from diasporas that we brought in, uh, but also Canadians that have been here perhaps a little longer. And I think that is what uh, that's what Canadians expect. To and hear when's from us. that decision coming? Will that be in the in the report coming this fall? Like well, you'll put out another plan? So when I announced when I announced every year we announce the levels and I deposit uh, a report in front of Parliament. What I've done this year, contrary to other years, is to fold in the temporary levels, which often does get confused with the permanent levels, and often we get criticized for not integrating the temporary levels, which have jumped in the past year. And I think one of the reasons we focus past two years, one of the reasons that we focus so heavily on temporary migration is because of the significant jumps that we've seen in the student cohorts, in the postgraduate work permit cohorts, uh, and saying that certainly needs to get it under control. It's been overheated, but we're not excluding other areas as well. Do you take responsibility for overseeing? The system, just final question, that did get overheated. I mean, the permanent levels you set, the temporary levels you did not impose a cap on until this year. Well, I think every minister, every minister needs to take responsibility for the files they're in. They also need to take the responsibility to make the same choices and not remain uh, dogmatic to any particular view in society. And I think that's the responsibility I have. And in the next year, I think Canadians expect us to continue to take aggressive action where they think uh, it makes sense for the economy and their lives. I'm going to leave it on that note. Minister, I appreciate your time today very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Morella, I'll throw it back to you.